We're very lucky today. We're lucky to have all our speakers, but our next speaker is renowned throughout the state of California for his expertise on matters of state fiscal policy. He was one of our featured speakers at the July summit. But we're the only place in California that has the privilege of calling him one of our own because he lives down the street in Napa. Please join me in welcoming Fred Silva, who, like all of our other speakers, is donating his Saturday to this effort for which we are most appreciative. Fred Silva. Okay. You all ready to go? Yeah, I just need to get it up on the screen. Thank you, Diana. Thank you very much uh, for everyone's interest in this. I'm going to provide a little bit of a backdrop to the discussion we're going to have later. Um, if someone can tell me how I can get that up on the screen. Um, thank you. Uh, California Forward uh, was formed about two years ago. We are a nonprofit uh, organization. We are bipartisan. Uh, we are uh, funded by a group of foundations who a couple of years ago came to a number of uh, leaders, both Republican and Democrat, uh, in the state and said, you ought to put some energy into looking at reforms in the governance system not uh, simply uh, individual projects, individual issues, but rather looking at governance and public finance in California. Uh, what we came to the conclusion early on, as a number of others have, is we have lost our way. We had this long tradition in California uh, with roles and responsibilities well-defined at the community level and roles and responsibilities defined uh, at the state level. Much of the origin of that came out of the beginning of the, of the 20th century when uh, the voters in California uh, approved a measure called the separation of sources that said uh, local uh, taxes are used for local purposes and state taxes are used for state purposes. And all this made a great deal of sense. Uh, I may have, yeah, if people can, I don't know if people can see that or not. Um, so we, we had this tradition of, uh, of local responsibilities well-defined and the resources available to do that. Uh, that system lasted up until the latter part of the century. Some, of, some folks define that as June of 1978. I won't tell you what happened then, you all know. Uh, but some things happened during a period of time that, that did two things. One of them, it shifted obligations to the state level, and the other, it reduced this connection that, the, that citizens had with their local governments and their state governments, partly because you couldn't figure out who was responsible for what. Now, what we've done in uh, our short life is to define two sets of issues. One of them is a set of governance issues, the other is a set of fiscal issues. And today I'm going to talk primarily about the fiscal issues. Uh, we have a number of governance type uh, issues, term limits, uh, elections, uh, our electoral system, campaign finance that we're working on, but you're not going to see that in 2010. In 2010, we're going to focus on two things. One, the state fiscal system, and the other is the state local relationship. Because we think at root, uh, <coughs> there are three issues that need to be handled uh, as one, if you will. The state's revenue system, the state budgeting process, and uh, the state-local relationship. Now, uh, this is a, t a little tough to see, but I'll get over here and point it out. Uh, the state general fund, which is the main uh, uh, financing device uh, of the state spends about 40% of its resources on K-12 to education. Now, I know that, that we're a mix of, of schools here in Napa. Most of you are basic aid districts. We've got one, I think, that is a revenue limit district. Did I get that right? Um, so some of you are very concerned about this, and some of you are less concerned because of the nature of the way you're financed. Um, but about 40% of the state budget is committed to K-12 education. It's been that way for 30 years, friends. 30 years, about that amount of money has been committed to K-12 education. About another 10 to 12% to higher ed. That number has changed from time to time. There was a time when it was about 15%. Today, it's in the nines, all right? Um, so it's a little less. The Health and Human Services uh, obligations are financed at about 30% of the general fund, about a third, and the criminal justice system is a, gets about 10%. Now, what's interesting to look at this over time is that this number's been pretty much the same through any sort of fiscal difficulty. Uh, this, the higher ed number and the social services number tend to change when there are pressures in criminal justice. One of the things that California has not done is to manage its criminal justice system. 
this, this amount used to be about 5%. It's now 10. Well, where do they get the money to finance that? They get it from Health and Human Services and higher education. They don't get it from K-12. to So one of our difficulties in state finance is how we look at commitments of the state general fund and the process for doing that. Now, uh, added to that problem are these major swings we have in finance. This is uh, uh, the uh, pattern of uh, general fund expenditures which is attributable to some of this volatility we have in California. Um, many of us read about that. Uh, the, one of the reasons we're, that the state, is, the state finance is so volatile is because we have a dynamic economy. Nobody wants to give up the fact that we have a dynamic economy. The question is, what do we do with the resources that it produces? And we've suggested that one of the problems is that the state legislature tends to spend every nickel that it takes in. Now, those, now school districts, have reserve requirements, counties have reserve requirements, cities can have their own, and each of you as elected officials tend to think what's the reserve going to be, whether you're a city manager, county, the county exec, or the school superintendent, you're worried about that reserve requirement. Frankly, the legislature uh, and, and, and governors tend not to think like that, sorry, but th that's an admission I don't know they'd make. I'm gonna look at it as an analyst and say they don't. Um, and and the, uh, here's a good example. We had a major increase in, in one-time revenue in 1999 and 2000. They spent it, all right? We had a, a, sh a short-lived uh, economic downturn attributable to the high-tech industry, and the state had to take stuff apart that they'd had long commitments to, they had to take apart. If they had just taken the one-time revenue off the top of here and left it for reserves, these net numbers would not have been negative, all right? Pressures that you felt during 2000, uh, one through 2003, you would not have had to have felt if they had just t take put one-time revenue in a reserve. So we're suggesting that these swings in uh, state spending need to need to occur. For, for those school districts that are revenue limit districts, frankly, you were fairly happy with this because you got that in your spending base, okay? Counties were fairly happy with this because it went to programs for which you thought that programs that were underfunded. But I would ask you all to step back a bit and say, would you rather have a system that didn't simply offer additional funds from time to time and then had to steal it back again and rather have more consistency in finance? So how did we get to where we are? And there are some, of, some folks who think, well, it's a spending problem. And the politics of blame are really important to listen to here because there's one side of the room that'll say, well, the state's problem is really it's a spending problem. That's what it is. And another group says, no, it's a revenue problem. And I would submit to you that it's a little of both, but the spending side of it has to be explained. So what does the state do in 1998? The state decides to reduce the vehicle license fee. Now, is that a state tax that's used for a state purpose? No. It's always been a local revenue source because we took cars off the property tax in the, four, in the 30s and 40s. And we produced this vehicle license fee, which was allocated to cities and counties and has been that way since the 40s. So what does the state do? It's, it reduces the vehicle license fee and then backfills the loss to local governments. What's that? That's a spending increase. So by that very act, Spending went up, at the moment, about $6 billion. Now, you all got a great benefit from that, and our good friends uh, dr drafting and Prop 1A did a great job because they had the vehicle license fee backfill increased annually by the growth in the property tax. Many of us think that a higher reliance on the property tax is a good idea, and I'd continue to argue that it is. But what that did was that meant that the, uh, that the backfill for the vehicle license fee grew more rapidly. So the, bu the budget now has got $6 billion stuck in it in order, to, in order to provide a backfill to the reduction of the vehicle license fee. Well, you think the vehicle license fee reduction was a good idea or not, it cost the general fund $6 billion. The other example is the, diver is the diversion that the voters approved in Proposition 42 that took about a billion and a half dollars out of the general fund and gave it to transportation. Now, those of you who are part of the transportation industrial complex thought that was a good idea. But those of you who care about the health of the general fund, it was not paid for anywhere. So it cost the general fund a billion and a half. And I would submit to you that the underlying problem is nobody cares about the condition of the general fund. Fiscal balance is not important. Now, I'd ask uh, for all of the associations that you belong to, I'm going to try to form a new group called Friends of the General Fund. 
so that maybe somebody would care about the fiscal condition of the state so that you wouldn't have these major swings in, uh, in state finance that we have now. Now, over that 10-year period, a lot of things grew. The social services networks grew. One of them was the so-called Healthy Families Program that all of you know. That number, uh, that 39% per year is, is kind of overstated because it started from zero, all right? Now, did anybody figure out how it was going to be financed? No, the general fund was simply going to finance it. And at the very time we were making commitments to provide health insurance for kids, all right, for low-income families, we were taking money out of the general fund for uh, the vehicle license fee and transportation. So we had this great leakage in the general fund, assuming that we could finance all this stuff. Well, we can't. Our debt service went up uh, to, uh, on an annual basis of about 9%, and the reason for that is the state the, uh, legislature and governors figured out a release valve, and they did this on a bipartisan basis, a release valve to the pressures of balanced budgets. You think, well, you either reduce expenditures or you raise revenue. And somebody came up with a bright idea, how about if we could borrow money? Now, we've had a long history of not doing that, even uh, to the point that the Constitution in 1849 was written that said you can't borrow more than $300,000 without a vote of the people. All right? Well, the courts have allowed the legislature to get around that, so we borrowed money in order to finance budgets. And about half of that growth in the debt service is attributable to simply borrowing money for uh, operating expenditures. Now, how many of you, uh, as elected officials, um, would stand for your uh, budget folks to say, we've got a problem, let's borrow money to get our way out of it. Uh, sadly, the state did that uh, over a period of time. The, the bottom is the most troubling. Look at the K-12 to growth, uh, annual average growth, uh, uh, I'm sorry, K-14, to um, over that 10-year period was 4.5%. All right, remember earlier I said about 40% of the budget goes to K-12? to that K-14 number at 4.5% is one of the lowest growth numbers in, in the state finance over that 10-year period. And yet we think we have this commitment to K-12 or K-14 education. So uh, I'm going to uh, offer to you that one, as a sidebar here, one of the things we need to address is the school finance system. Now, my good friends uh, in uh, basic aid districts uh, will tend to... Uh, look at the floor quickly about that because school finance obviously looks at not only revenue limit issues but also basic aid issues. So at some point you're all going to have to breathe, take it a deep breath and look at the school finance system. Um, uh, partly because of the tensions that exist uh, with it, we haven't faced it. I think it's probably time to face the school finance system uh, to, in order to provide more community uh, uh, involvement in uh, school finance. Now, I, I mentioned that that's sort of a, a ca capsule of the budgeting dilemma. Um, let me t give you a little a short view about the, the um, uh, revenue dilemma. If we go back to the 50s, most of state finance was supported by the sales tax. This was at a time when over 65% of our disposable income was spent on durable goods, taxable goods, all right? Cars, refrigerators, and the rest. The remaining 35% on services. Well, guess what's happened over a period of time? That number has basically flipped. It's about 60% of our disposable income is spent for services. The remainder on durable goods and taxable goods, and that number is going to keep going down. All right, Every, all the analysts think this, that number is going to keep going down. Now it happens that over this period of time from the, the 50s, one of the things that was happening in California was its dynamic growth and as the dynamic growth occurred, incomes rose. The uh, growth in personal income in California is like no other state in the country. We have a trillion and a half dollars of personal income, it grows nicely, uh, recessions notwithstanding. And what that means is that the amount of revenue that's attributable to personal income has grown in California. Right about here, in 1986, the state did something very important. And that was it made a decision uh, when it conformed to federal tax changes in 1986, is it drove the income tax liability up the income ladder. And so we took a lot of middle income and lower income individuals off of the tax system, and in effect, we set tax rates and, and deductions and credits 
so that, that lower income and, and lower middle income would pay very little in the way of income taxes or nothing at all. And then <coughs> we, j we put more people with higher income uh, into the uh, higher tax liability. We have a 9.3% uh, income tax. Um, uh, we, but uh, as many of you know, you don't pay 9.3%. You pay probably in the fives or sixes because of uh, deductions and credits. But what that's done is that has made the state's revenue structure far more volatile by that, uh, by those, by, you can see by the, by the way that line uh, moves on the chart. So one of the issues that we've been talking about is what to do about the volatility of income and how the state's revenue structure operates. These lines on the bottom are the corporate uh, taxes. One of the things that, that I'm, I'm, uh, obvious, I'm uh, always interested in is the way people look at our corporate income tax. Uh, the state, as a matter of policy, keeps that puppy flat. All right? If it looks like it's raising too much money, we flatten it out. We have a whole lot of exemptions and credits in the, in the corporate tax system to, to make sure that corporate tax uh, liabilities don't do what the income tax liabilities do. So. Um, uh, we, this is this uh, notion of volatility that our revenues are far more volatile than the, than the uh, uh, income. Uh, what, one of the things that this has produced, oh, thank you very much. Could you tell me one more time? Give me five minutes. Yeah, thanks. Um, what, <laughs> one of the difficulties here, uh, when you look at revenue volatility, the fact that the state spends every nickel that it takes in, the fact that it doesn't, it doesn't, um, uh, have a method for achieving fiscal balance as a policy matter. That is to say, governors don't seem to care, legislatures don't seem to care that fiscal balance matters. What happens is that expenditures over uh, about a 10-year period tend to exceed revenues. If you can see this, these orange lines are expenditures and these, revenue li uh, these um, blue lines are tax revenues. All right? You go, well, how can they do that? Well, they do it in two ways. They either borrow money or they steal money from you. And so to make the, the expenditure, to have enough cash for the expenditure line to work, because they don't have sufficient revenue, they either get it by borrowing money or, or being able to use local resources because they can. And there was, again, this time when they couldn't use local resources for state purposes. And now, if you, sp you talk with members or budgeting staffs, on a bipartisan basis, those who wish to protect locally levied taxes for local purposes, their, re their reaction to that is, yeah, but that's part of the state's revenue system. It's as though a culture has changed. And part of our task is to try to see if we can't get this culture changed that says you don't meet a spending obligation with local resources or borrowed money. The current problem, in part, is because our budgeting framework is, is known as a workload budgeting system, where we say, what, what, what do we have to do in 2010-11? And so everybody adds that up, and they come up with a cost of about $102 billion. Well, how much revenue are we going to have? Well, we're going to have about $89 billion. That's the revenue forecast for taxes. And so there's a gap. Now, it happens that 2009-10 is going to run a deficit. We're going to run a minus balance from this from uh, this current fiscal year into next fiscal year. Although there's a balanced budget requirement in the Constitution, it's only for the governor to introduce a balanced budget and the legislature to pass a balanced budget, but there's no obligation to maintain it. So we run deficits. We run minus balances into uh, the next year. And we'll carry probably $5 billion, depending on what the legislature and the governor do now about fixing that. They won't. They'll fix maybe $2 billion of it. Um, but the, one of the dilemmas is that we've got a minus balance of $5 billion going into next year. Uh, so that produces this $18 billion gap. It's not a deficit, remember. It's a gap. There's a gap between resources available and, and this notion of spending needs. Now, how much are we spending this year of the general fund? About $85 billion. So if you thought about this and got rid of this notion of workload adjustments and said, what can you get your best uh, value for money? in 2010-11 off of the 2009-10 budget, all right? What can you do better next year with the resources available? That gap would basically go away and you'd be talking about what can we do best with $89 billion. Now that may not meet everybody's needs, but it's sort of where we are and the way public budgeting 
we would argue anyway, ought to be viewed. This lack of accountability is, this, is, about the, is my final issue. And the lack of accountability deals with, with the, the citizens' knowledge about where their money goes and the value they get for it. Now, it's pretty easy to understand that the income tax um, is owned and operated by the state. And frankly, as an analyst, happily, nobody has suggested that we have a locally levied income tax. Probably a big mistake in, a, in an economy this dynamic. But for the sales tax, everybody uses it. It's a transaction tax. We've had it for a long time. Everybody has a transaction tax. Many uh, of you uh, have been involved in local campaigns about the, the uh, uh, add-ons for the sales tax in Napa County. The property tax, is my, in my view, is the biggest problem. Because in 1978, when the voters approved Prop 13, they said three things. They said, we're going to have a fixed tax rate. We're going to have an assessment system that's based on acquisition not on market value. And the other thing we're going to do is we're going to hand the operation of the, or the allocation of the property tax to the state. Now, I would submit to you that Howard Jarvis didn't say the latter. Uh, in fact, the way they drafted it, they couldn't figure out what to do with the money. They know they wanted a fixed rate. They knew they, wa they, know they wa knew they wanted a new assessment system, but they couldn't figure out what to do with the money, so they just gave it to the state. <laughs> Now, currently, that's 84 billion, I'm sorry, that is uh, about $42 billion of resources that we all collectively would think are used for local services. And in fact, the state thinks it's part of the state FISC. So one issue here that we haven't come to grips with is what ought we to do about the property tax as a locally levied tax? Should we return it as a locally levied tax? Should it be locally levied again under a cap? That's a question that I'd offer to you. What do we do about returning the property tax to community governments for community purposes and not, uh, not let the state use it uh, to finance uh, things that its revenue systems won't? What do other people think about us? Well, the Pew Center on the states has us, uh, in terms of ranking fiscal management, they have us dead last. They have us at a D plus along with uh, with Rhode Island, which apparently has a similar problem. So our fiscal management structure needs to be overhauled. Um, our, uh, as I mentioned earlier, th this relationship between local services that are financed by the, by the state budget and how community services actually operate those are essential. Um, so uh, what should we do about all this? What we're gonna do in the next session is, or a session after this, yeah, exactly. Uh, and we're going to talk about what to do next. Matt's going to talk about that, and uh, I think Chris or someone from the league is going to talk about the league's proposal. Oh, okay. So, uh, it, any qu questions now? Any? Is there a question today and not a schedule today? Yes. Hi, I'm Um. When you talk about sales tax and the way people are shopping, um, we all know that online shopping is really big, but we don't get the sales tax for most of online shopping. And what um, was okay. uh, presented at the Economic Energy Forum of Sustainable Napa County just this last week, they talked about um, the purchase of automobiles moving more onto online, so therefore, we would even lose a lot more if we weren't able to pay those taxes. So I want to know, uh, what are we, are, what can we do about that? Because I see that we're losing an awful lot of revenue in our state by not having the sales tax on everything that we purchase. Yeah, very good. Uh, the, the, the issue here uh, is whether or not the, <coughs> the online uh, company has a nexus in California. I suspect with automobiles, there'll still be a, tax, a sales tax levied. We have a law in California that says if you purchase something online where uh, there is uh, an actual outlet for the company, then a sales tax has to be applied. And the Board of Equalization is pretty aggressive in, as, at enforcing it. The problem, of course, is where an online merchant doesn't have an outlet in California. For cars, I don't think it's a problem because Ford decides to go online. I'll bet there's a Ford dealer not far from you. So there isn't one in, in uh, American Canyon, but nonetheless, that isn't a problem. Um, uh, borders, now finally, uh, because they've got outlets in California, you buy a Borders book online, you're gonna pay a sales tax. Uh, 
The problem here is the United States Congress because the, the U.S. Supreme Court some time ago said this is an issue for the Congress to settle and that states don't have the ability through interstate commerce to levy taxes um, for where there's no nexus in the state. Now that, frankly, is becoming, for California, a smaller and smaller group because uh, whether, again, it's Sears or something where there's a nexus, you have to pay a sales tax. And I'm hoping in time that's going to narrow, but we're waiting for the Congress to solve that problem. Anybody else? Yes. We're obviously here a collection of, of local people. Are there any people at, in the, at the state level who, are <coughs> who agree that the system is broken and instead of just being ensconced in that system, does anyone at the state level have any ideas about how to solve this? Where are they going? Or are they all just fine with the status quo? Yeah, good question. Um, uh, my early years in, uh, uh, I worked for the Senate Local Government Committee back in some earlier mist of time in the 1970s. And uh, local officials who were elected to the legislature, you know, before term limits, so there wasn't a lot of turnover. Uh, I found that the local officials who sat on my committee um, had a sense of proportion about statewide issues and local issues. Those who hadn't been through that mm, tended not to think in that way. So at the state level, <coughs> you'd think, well, there are local elected officials who have, because of term limits, who are now members of the Assembly or Senate and would have their own views about that. A and sadly, um, and all, all of you understand this because you're elected officials, your constituency changes the day you leave town. And so your interest in statewide reform becomes more an issue mm -hmm. over how a particular thing that you care about uh, is advanced, whether it's a social services issue or it's an K-12 education issue. Uh, maybe you were a uh, teacher, maybe you were a member of a school board. And so the, at the statewide level, there frankly, there's not a lot of interest in major reforms that we're talking about. Part of that is, um, uh, and, I, and I, I don't want to define this as special interest versus public interest because we all have a, an interest that can be defined as a special interest. It's the general public interest that gets missed at the state level when we talk about reform. And their list of reforms tends to be relatively short. Democrats say, get rid of the two-thirds vote on taxes. Thank you very much. Make that go away. The Republicans say, oh, I don't, we don't want to do that. Um, so that list of issues is very narrow, sadly. <laughs> Partly because of, the, of this kind of interest-based uh, view that uh, uh, statewide politicians tend to have. Anybody else? Nope. Right. Yes. Yeah, the question was how, how old is the budget system that we have in California? What, where, where are, what are its origins? Uh, the origin of a unified budget in California actually is an initiative measure that the Commonwealth Club put on the ballot in 1924. Uh, before it's a, I'll, I hope I'm not boring you with another little story, but uh, the business leaders in the Bay Area, uh, the Commonwealth Club, uh, later the Bay Area Council, very active in, uh, in regional affairs, they go to Sacramento and they see the dysfunction of the budgeting system and they go to the legislators and say, you know, you're passing individual bills for individual programs, so maybe there's 10 million that goes to a program through an through a individual bill, the governor signs it, there's no unified budget. We think you ought to have a unified budget. And here's an idea to do that. And the legislature sends them away, <laughs> says, no, we don't want to do that. So they put a measure on the ballot that instituted a uniform uh, budget. We, uh, of the states in the country, we have a strong executive budget. Our, our budgeting system from 1924 is a strong executive as opposed to a weak executive. Some states actually have legislatures write budgets. Um, uh, I wouldn't recommend it here. Uh, so so we, we had that system uh, up until the 60s. Uh, we had biennium budgets. Uh, we had a, uh, what is, can best be described as a uh, part-time, didn't meet very often uh, uh, legislature. 
uh, sort of unfocused on, for the most part, on uh, major policy issues until uh, post-World War II period, the <coughs> late 40s and 50s. Um, biennium budgets, we get into the 60s, life gets more complex. We go from a biennium budget into uh, an annual budgeting process. That annual, annual budgeting process is based on you get what you got in the prior year plus growth. So as I mentioned earlier, most, most of this debate over the last 25 years in budgeting has been interest group by interest group. What am I going to get more than I got last year? Whether you care about foster care, whether you care about transportation, whatever you care about, you get what you got in the prior year plus growth. And the debate is always over that. The governor comes in and says, I want to give this program 4%. You as the activist say, I, we need eight. Legislature says, hmm, four, eight, how about six? <laughs> and you settle on, you get what you got in the prior year plus some growth amount. The question of the, of the viability of the program, what it delivers, does it provide benefits, is a lesser question than you get what you got in the prior year plus growth. So I appreciate Chris's uh, prodding here about how does that system work and how is it developed. Our concern is that this get what you got in the prior year plus growth is what has to change and it needs to be more performance based. Uh, so but from the 1960s up until now it has been this system of you get what you got in the prior year plus growth and we're suggesting that, it, that that system ought to change to go to more of a performance based system. Um, plus the vote requirement, we're going to talk about that at the next panel.